Thank you very much. Uh, my presentation is based on research done for the World, the UN World Social Report, which will be released in December. So it hasn't been released yet. There's space to make some changes. So your feedback today will be very useful for that. Um, the theme of the report is population aging. So as Carlos said, I'm going to focus on age-based inequalities in poverty, mostly, not only. And uh, just one caveat or warning is that my presentation is rather, the analysis I present is rather basic because the report is global and uh, it's meant for a broad audience. It's, it's the, the, the main focus is policy, so please bear with me. Um, the analysis is basic. So leaving no one behind is a very useful um, policy slogan, if we may call it that, but analytically is a concept that is difficult to grasp. There's not one single indicator or not even you know, a group of indicators that one can use to answer the question. In my case today, I'm going to focus mainly on income poverty, but older persons, which is what I'm focusing on, face many spatial and social barriers beyond the purely economic that preclude their participation in economic and social life. We go through this in the report, but I'm not going to talk about them here today. Another question is who is being left behind? Older persons in, are a very heterogeneous group, if we can call them a group. So the question is what subgroups of older persons are being left behind or are more disadvantaged? And another question that I'll show a little bit of research on here is, uh, can we say anything about the future prospects uh, looking at today's generation of youth and adults? So, um, Estimating poverty by age, I thought it was going to be simpler than it is, but we obviously work with household survey data, which do not provide information on the distribution of uh, income or consumption within households. So without individual level information, it is often assumed that resources are distributed equitably among members of the household. But there's a significant amount of research that shows that they are not, that uh, often women, especially, and older persons often have lower living standards than other members of the household. We cannot estimate that. So what we can say is what number of people or what number of older people um, are in poor households, not whether they live in poverty or not. There's other methodological challenges to estimating poverty, disaggregating poverty by age. Uh, one is the use of different equivalent scales, which I'll show an example later, but they have a, a, a big impact on, on the estimates. Then there's the issue of whether we use income or consumption to estimate poverty. So there's, there's a number of issues that makes the, make the estimate, some estimates somehow unreliable. But there's some of the findings that we'll present that, hold, that, that remain the same regardless of the uh, methodological assumptions made. Um, well, having said that, I'm, I'm showing you the estimates. Um, I'm using a, a relative measure of poverty. And what the estimates show is that Older persons, which we define as persons 65 or older, live more often in poverty than the working age population, both in developed and developing countries, although the, uh, the differences are larger in developing countries for obvious reasons. For obvious reasons, there are less um, social protection systems are lacking and access to uh, uh, health care is less broad and so on. Um, children and youth, by the way, are also more often in relative poverty than, than the working age population. As to who is in poverty, um, first by age is the, the oldest old, the, uh, the, the population uh, age 80 or older. They are poorer than any other age group, both in rich and poor countries. Here a parenthesis, I, I mentioned equivalent scales. The equivalent, scale, equivalent scales are, the, um, are used to adjust for population size in estimating poverty. The equivalent scale we have used for our report is the square root scale, which I don't know if uh, you are familiar since it's a small audience. If you are familiar with equivalent scales, I can skip that, otherwise I can explain what it is. Um, the square root equivalent scale assumes that... Um, oh, pardon. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, you haven't heard anything until now? Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, the square root equivalent scale um, assumes that uh, resources, um, the cost of living doesn't increase proportionally with each member of the household because some costs in households are relatively fixed. That's the case, for example, of uh, the cost of electricity or even housing. Um, the, the, the blue bars show the estimates using the square root equivalent scale. 
Now, if we use a different equivalent scale, which is one that was used by OECD until recently, which gives a value of one to the first adult in the household, 0.5 to other adults in the household, 0.3 to children, the estimates we obtain are very different. So we just have to be aware of that. Um, but again, some findings remain. One is that the population 80 or oldest is the one that lives the most often in poor households of all age groups. The other one is that older women are uh, more often poor than older men, no big surprise here. The, uh, oh, by the way, the, uh, the, uh, the y-axis scales are not comparable because what I want to compare is men and women in each of the regions, okay? The scales are different. But um, so older women are more often poor than men. In fact, in rich countries, old age poverty is entirely explained by uh, higher levels of poverty among older women. Older men are not poorer than um, working age adult men. Um, why is that? Well, there's a, a, a significant pension gap in pension coverage and in pension adequacy, both, both things between men and women. Uh, women participate less in the labor market. When they do, they have lower wages. They have shorter working lives because um, care and domestic tasks are not distributed equitably between men and women. They, uh, for the same reasons, they, are, they accumulate less wealth, also because uh, property rights and uh, inheritance rights even are, are, not, are, are not the same for women in many countries. And also they live longer than men. And as a result of that, they are often widowed and they live more often alone. And living alone matters. In fact, old age poverty is higher than adult poverty, mainly because uh, older people live more often um, alone than, um, than adults. And that's especially the case for women. So here there's a self-reinforcing effect of uh, one person households being poorer because it's mostly women's, women's poverty being uh, higher because they live alone more often. So it's like a, a self-reinforcing uh, channel. Multiple person households are um, uh, a mixed bag. They include intergenerational households, uh, skip generation households, couples, older couples living alone. But um, surprisingly, the the proportion of households living in poverty is quite similar regardless of the type of household, be it older couples or multi-generational households. The levels of poverty are quite simple. It's one per one person households that stand out the most. Um, um, I'm forgetting something. We look, I'm going to go through this quickly. We look at the effect of many variables in explaining old age poverty in the report. One of them is education. Education obviously has a a significant impact of the, on the odds of living in poverty, both for men and for women, controlling for many other things, place of residence, living arrangements, uh, employment history, and so on. But for men and women in developed and in developing countries, this is the, the table on the left-hand side of the, of the slide. But education does not have such a significant impact in explaining the, the, the gender gap in poverty. So the, the women's disadvantage remains even when we adjust for education. Um, I'm moving now to another topic. I said I was going to just give snapshots of different parts of the report. I don't have a, a long, consistent story, just snapshots. One thing we look into in the report is what can we say about the future of older persons by looking at today's youth and adults. And there are good news. Um, uh, so consecutive generations or cohorts of people are increasingly uh, healthier, they have longer life expectancies, they are also more educated despite the effect of the COVID crisis. So they, um, they can be more productive and they can be more productive until later in life. At the same time, they are also economically more unequal and in some cases more economically insecure. And I'm going to just focus on this bad news for a minute if I have time. Um, this graph shows income inequality measured by the Gini coefficient across successive cohorts, uh, birth cohorts, uh, by age. The birth cohorts we can look at right now are the cohorts between the 19, born between the 1920s, shown in the brown or orange uh, line, and the cohort born in the 1980s, shown in the, in the blue line. Uh, in developing countries, there's at, at, at any given age, there's an increase in inequality measured by the Gini coefficient from one um, cohort to the next. In developed countries, too, with exceptions, and I can maybe try to explain these exceptions later if there is time. But the point is that 
up to the generation of the 90, the court of the 1980s, there is an increase in inequality. Now we don't know about the next course, but at least for the next 25 to 30 years, we can expect, based on these trends, that older persons in the next 20, 30 years may be more unequal once they reach old age. All else remain equal. Um, what are the drivers of this increasing income inequality? A very important one are labor market trends. They have been discussed in other sessions. There is growing labor market polarization, but there's other things happening too. Now, I know that unemployment is not, it's a very partial and incomplete indicator of labor market conditions, but I'm able to show it by cohort, so <laughs> it adds some value. And we see that uh, unemployment has increased from one cohort to the next, both in developing and in developed regions. Um, um, youth labor for participation has declined across cohorts. Here I'm mixing developed and developing countries, but the trends are similar in both including even among younger women, even among women aged 25 to 29 throughout the most recent cohorts. Um, there's obviously part of this is due to the fact that people are staying in education for more years, but there's also an increase in the number of discouraged young workers who are uh, available to work, but are not, not actively looking for work because they don't have opportunities, they don't see opportunities. And in the number of youth who neither who are neither in education nor in employment, the so-called NEETs, which we can observe in some countries only. There's other trends that have also been described, and I don't have court specific data for this, and I don't even have trend data for this, but we know that there's a persistent informal employment. Uh, informal employment is stubborn. It's uh, where, where we have trend data, uh, we see that informal employment is rarely the percentage of informal employment, total employment is rarely declining. Um, it's one of the most intractable problems in the labor market. In addition to that, there's an increase, especially in rich countries, of casual work, meaning part-time and um, temporary work and um, on-call work, um, self-employment, work for different employers as part of the gig economy, partly, but not only. So all, what do, do these trends mean? It means that there's an increasing economic insecurity that may spill over into old age, so that we have to, for policymakers, the message is that they have to take that into account where, when they think about uh, the future of social protection and retirement policies and so on. Because um, that's the next question. So what can be done? What can we do to leave no one behind in old age? Skipping a little bit forward here. The main broad message we give is that policies in old age are too little too late, that poverty in an, and inequality need to be addressed along, along the life cycle. We take a life cycle approach in the report. We show how much uh, early life conditions matter to explain the well-being of older persons, that the policy conclusion is that we have to start acting at birth or before birth. And the policies that have to be implemented here have been discussed in, in other sessions. Um, I will not go into them again here just maybe to highlight how important labor market policies are. And also to highlight that there has been a lot of talk during these three past three days about the importance of social protection. But what is happening is that social protection programs are increasingly disconnected from trends in the labor market and the reality of today's lives, people's lives. And that's something that has to be taken into account in, um, uh, expanding or even uh, reforming social protection systems. When it comes to policies in old age, in, uh, in developed countries, the whole policy debate is focused on the fiscal sustainability of old age pensions. And in the report, we do not go into answering whether this concern is uh, uh, how do I say, justifiable or not. We just say that many of the policies and policy reforms that are being put in place in response to these worries about fiscal sustainability are regressive, meaning they affect low-income workers more negatively than high-income workers. Say, for instance, how much time do I have? Okay, can I just put an example of why some of these policies are regressive? Um, raising the age of retirement, for example. Low-income workers have lower life expectancies on average than, than high-income workers. So by raising um, the age of retirement, they lose more from uh, lifetime earnings in, in the sense of pensions than high-income workers. Um, 
uh, say, for example, the move from defined benefit to defined contribution schemes, also regressive because low-income workers have less ability to uh, save privately. They have less access, they have less financial knowledge and less access, access to financial instruments and so on. Uh, we give some recommendations on alternative measures that can be put in place to fix this, this regressive effect of these policies. But the other issue is that in countries that do not have comprehensive access to pensions or social protection systems, the fiscal, the, the fiscal sustainability debate is premature, that what these countries have to focus on is expanding uh, pension and social protection coverage more in general, and making social protection systems more adequate, adequate to the reality of today, and, uh, and creating the fiscal space also to, to expand social protection systems. Um, I can go into more detail on, 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 on how this should be done, but just to say all these policies that we recommend will, will um, uh, affect uh, disadvantaged groups favorable, including women. There are addition, additional policy measures that can be put in place to, to address high levels of poverty among women, including older women, um, and they have a lot to do with care, with the unequal distribution of care, so they have to do with uh, policies and employment policies that allow women and men to balance uh, work and family life. They have to do with investing in formal care services, promoting the formalization of the care economy, which is mostly informal for now, promoting equal rights, access to, uh, to inheritance and property rights for women. And in terms of social protection, expanding um, non-contributory uh, or also called tax-funded pension schemes. Um, I'll stop here.